Good morning. Welcome, everyone. We're happy to see you here today. I appreciate you spending your morning with us, whether in person or on Zoom. Thank you for being here. My name is Dr. Megan Stitt. I'm the Assistant Dean for External Relations for the UCCS College of Business. And one of my roles is to oversee the Executive Education Program, which is why I'm here with you today. So before we begin, I just want to talk a little bit about our partnership with uh, between UCCS and the Chamber and EDC. Uh, the goal of these business briefings is to bridge the gap between research and application. So we identify a faculty member at UCCS who is well-versed in the research related to a business topic, and then we match that faculty member um, with a chamber member who is actively engaged in the area of interest. So this overlap between research and application provides you with unique perspectives uh, on the topic at hand, which today happens to be all about entrepreneurship. And lastly, before we get started, I want to provide you with a brief overview of the offerings available through the UCCS Executive Education Program. So we offer trainings for local business professionals, so we can develop a customized training uh, for your, your organization on any given business topic. And we also have open enrollment programs, which um, you can enroll in, view online, which programs we have available. We're currently accepting applications for our mini MBA, um, which would really help you increase your business acumen. Um, and we have a capstone project as part of the mini MBA program where you have a $75,000 impact for your organization within a 75 day period and all led by our world renowned faculty. So if you have any training needs, I'd be delighted to talk to you about what we can do for your organization. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Trinity Bradley Anderson from the Chamber of EDC to introduce today's topic as well as our presenters. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us virtually and in person. We would love to have more in-person people joining us today, but we have who we have. So um, thank you for joining the Flow of Entrepreneurship, Anticipating Challenges. I am Trinity Bradley Anderson. I'm a board member of the Chamber at EDC. I serve as a treasurer currently. Today, you will get a first-hand look at potential challenges and ways to be prepared when they do arise. And if you can think about the last year, it has been nothing but challenge. Our speakers today will walk you through the typical flow of entrepreneurship while sharing lessons learned from their own experiences in owning a business. To introduce you to our speakers, we have Cindy Rayfield. She is the owner of Franchise Matchmakers and Cookie Cutters Hair Salon. Cindy worked in corporate America for over 20 years before breaking the corporate chains in 2001. Since then, she has owned a few different businesses, including a website, a copywriting business, a publication franchise, and a consulting practice. She is now a multi-unit owner of a children's hair care franchise. Cindy loves all things franchising and has been a franchise broker since 2009, helping others find the perfect franchise fit. She is also a proud Colorado native and a graduate of the University of Denver. We also have with us today, Dr. Thomas Denning. He's our professor from UCCS. Thomas Denning is the Elkmar Chair of Business and Entrepreneurship Director for the Center of Entrepreneurship, the Center of the Management Department in the UCCS College of Business. Dr. Denning is also the author of numerous academic journal articles and 19 books on business management and entrepreneurship. He has founded 11 companies, both for profit and non for profit, over a 37 year career in entrepreneurship. He earned his MBA and PhD degrees from the University of Minnesota. Did I say that correctly, Minnesota? <laughs> With that, let's begin the program, and thank you so much for joining us today. <clears throat> thank you, Trinity. Uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship. Um, this title, The Flow of Entrepreneurship, is kind of an interesting title. Uh, and I think most people would be interested in knowing where it came from. Uh, and, you know, it it's kind of comes from my own career. And um, when we were discussing the topics for this, it's, it's it reflected as well in my research, which has uh, is, been ongoing now since 1992. Uh, I started teaching entrepreneurship in 19. I've been an entrepreneur since 1984. We founded the first Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Houston in 1992. And 
I was kind of curious about this whole thing about entrepreneurship. I've never studied entrepreneurship, as, as you heard. My, my degrees were something other than entrepreneurship for certain. Uh, I was an entrepreneur before I even knew uh, that it was a field of study. So it's like, how does that happen to people? How do you get into entrepreneurship? How does that happen? Is there something unique about entrepreneurship? And so here I am 37 years later, after having started my first venture and several others along the way. And I, and I still wonder how it is that it's all come about and how it happens and, and what are the what are, you know, what's the essence of creating that, that opportunity? And of course, the scholarship in entrepreneurship also focuses on how do you generate opportunity and, and where does it come from? And, and you know, is there something unique about entrepreneurs that differentiates them from everybody else in society? Are we that kind of strange human beings that you know we're gonna go ahead and take all this risk? Or, or, or what, what exactly is it? So that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about today a little bit. Is I'm gonna focus uh, in part on my research, which has been trying to answer that question. Not only how does it come about, but how do you teach it? If I'm responsible for the lives of these young people that sit in my classroom, and I am now trying to dissuade them from their career path, which is to go in to be an accountant, or to be a computer scientist, or to be a financial analyst, or whatever it might be, and I am now responsible for them perhaps thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, and completely changing their career path and their life path, much to the chagrin perhaps of their parents and everybody else in their lives, I need to know what the hell I'm doing, right? I can't just go into the classroom and say, hey, be an entrepreneur and be like me, you know, and, and suffer all the different kinds of stresses and strains that I've had to go through in my life. And so I need to know what I'm doing, uh, or at least feel like I know what I'm doing. And so that's kind of where this whole thing came from. And, and my colleagues and I, uh, have uh, several different concepts that we've developed over the years. This is a book that recently came out called Entrepreneurial Identity. And this is our, uh, this is a book that we did uh, a couple years ago. And what we are trying to understand is, is there something that it is to be an entrepreneur? And is it something that you can practice even when you're not running a venture, right? So is there something that happens to human beings uh, between the, uh, the, you know, the easy part actually is running a venture. The hard part is sort of what you do in between the ventures to prepare yourself for the opportunities that, that come along. So I can teach anybody to write a business plan. That's easy. I can teach anybody to do a financial forecast. That's easy. That's a spreadsheet. That's not hard. The hard part, right, is getting off sort of, uh, you know, um, getting out into the world and actually making things happen, winning a customer, making, you know, making uh, that revenue stream a reality. So we think that there's a lot that can be done between the venture uh, activities. And so we created this concept of entrepreneurial identity. And, and <clears throat> the core of it is this model, right? So every, every good academic has to have a model, right? And it's sort of what we're trying to do is capture the flow of entrepreneurship. And this model then, as you can see, the past, the present, and the future, right? So that's a flow. It's the best you can do in a, in a sort of a, two-dimensional format like this is, is to kind of show that we all kind of are moving through life from maybe, let's say, from the time we're 20 years old, we start thinking about what am I going to do for the rest of my life until we're 60-some years old like me, and you're thinking, what the hell happened to me along this way? And so you can see that at any given moment in the present, and I'm talking about, you know, sort of what we're doing to uh, teach entrepreneurship. So we teach aspiring entrepreneurs. I want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and I've self-identified that this is something I want to be. But of course, in that moment that I'm teaching you, you bring all this past experience, native talent, and your temperament and everything else into the brain, right? And I have to deal with that. And of course, every single human being that is sitting here wants to be an entrepreneur. Oops, I didn't know that, that was the question. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> Every single person that wants to be an entrepreneur is different. So I, I sit in, you know, I've got 25, 30 students in my class, and they're all similar. Every single one of them is different. They all bring a different temperament. They bring past experiences that are different. They bring different native talents into the room. And so how do you teach something when everybody is different? Well, here's how it kind of works, right? So while you're an aspiring entrepreneur and I'm teaching you stuff, 
your personal knowledge is expanding in two different directions at the same time. I'm teaching you stuff basically that everybody else already knows about entrepreneurship, how to do a business plan, how to do a financial forecast, how to, how to uh, you know, ideate an idea, how to uh, get, get in the problem space. So that's stuff that everybody already knows, right? And that's, you know, that's sort of like canonical knowledge that you need to understand about being an entrepreneur. But what's critical is what do you discover that's novel? When you begin to orient yourself to customers and markets and opportunities, you start to see things that other people have not seen before. And suddenly opportunities arise. And it doesn't need to be something earth shattering. It doesn't need to be uh, completely unique. It just needs to be perhaps a little bit different. So when I talk about the novelty, right, that you're trying to learn on your own, discover something that nobody else knows. I'm talking about being on what we call the value frontier, right? The value frontier. So you're creating value uh, and you're looking for opportunities to create value as an entrepreneur, the same way a scientist is creating knowledge. Right? So a scientist goes into the laboratory or out into the field or wherever they might be. And their hope is that by this exploration process, they're gonna come up with some new knowledge that hasn't been discovered before that they can then share with the rest of humanity. And the entrepreneur is doing something very, very similar. I, the entrepreneur is trying to discover new value that has never been discovered before. And then to share it with humanity, right? And to generate a profit. How does that happen? How does that happen that you discover that novelty? And I'm going to give you some examples. As I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my ventures. So I tether it to reality, right? Because I never teach anything in the classroom that I haven't personally experienced in my own uh, entrepreneurial career. So what, what it boils down to is how do you move into the future as an aspiring entrepreneur with the desire to come up with something unique in the way of value creation? Well, you practice what we call the entrepreneurial virtues, right? So you move into the future by creating value for other people. That's the core virtue. That is the central virtue. I get up every day and I say to myself, how do I create value for other people? Right? And it's, it's through that process of transformation of what it is that you pay attention to in the world that leads you to the opportunity to create value for the people. The second uh, virtue is respect the value judgments of the marketplace. Right? So the marketplace is the arbiter of value. If I create a solution for something that has no market, then I haven't created anything that the market values and it's not going to work in, in terms of creating invention. Be resourceful and optimistic. Resourceful and optimistic, right? So I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs come into my office and sit down and chat with me. And they're like, you know, I've got this great idea, but I just want to raise a little bit more money, or I'm just not, I need to have a few more things in place. I'm just not quite ready, right? And so the point is, if you are a pioneer on the value frontier, you don't go into the frontier with everything that you possibly need to, to succeed, right? Think about Lewis and Clark when they left from St. Louis to head to the to find the Northwest Passage. They didn't bring all their supplies, but then when they left, they were optimistic that they were going to be resourceful enough to find what they need along the way. Same thing as you need to begin on. Honor your contracts and promises. This is the integrity piece. And then be resilient because you will fail. There will be failures, and you will have to find a way to recover from those failures. And, and so the technical definition of a virtue is consistent positive action in the world. This, this differs now. You know, there was a, a time in entrepreneurship education where it was thought that we were going to teach people how to develop a mindset, an entrepreneurial mindset. But I can't, I can't tell whether you have a mindset. There's no way that you can that you can, uh, that I can tell by looking at you what your mindset is, but I can tell what it is that you're doing in the world, right? So virtue is consistent, positive action in the world. And consistent means that it's not something that you do occasionally. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, you literally have to be practicing these five virtues on a daily basis, right? I have to always be thinking about how do I create value for the people using the talents and resources that I currently possess? Right? And if you constantly do this, it's like 
you know, when you're thinking about buying a new car or, or whatever, right? Suddenly, all of a sudden, you see all these things that you didn't see before, all these different types of cars that you might want to buy that you that were just driving by before. Your attention shifts, right? So you have to educate your attention. What am I going to pay attention to? I'm going to pay attention to creating value for other people on a consistent basis, right? It's positive. It's something that's socially accepted, right? So virtue is something that your group accepts, right? So generally speaking, if you want to be an entrepreneur, it needs to be something that you truly believe in. It's something that you want to do with your life, right? Um, then it's action in the world. So it's a choice. Nobody's forcing you to be an entrepreneur. Nobody's forcing you to create value for other people. Nobody is, nobody is putting their gun to your head saying, be an entrepreneur. You are freely choosing this in your life. And then it's in the world in, in the sense that it's something that you do that affects others, right? So that's our technical definition of a virtue. And of course, I mean, think about honesty, right? Many people think of honesty as a virtue. Well, I mean, think about it. If I was going to be an honest person, and I just did it at my convenience, would the other people think of me as being an honest person? Probably not, right? It's like, no, you're kind of... Uh, somebody that uh, I can't trust because I don't know when you're being honest or not, right? So you gotta practice all the time, all the time, if that's a virtue. Uh, and here's kind of how we looked at it, right? So this is kind of a, not a great little graphic, but it's the best that we can do as a bunch of academics, right? And it shows that there's a difference between what we call entrepreneurial develop, entrepreneur development activity, EDA, and venture development activity. Right? So over the course of my life, I can develop myself as an entrepreneur every single day. Entrepreneur development activities. I can create value for the people. I can honor contracts. I can be resourceful. I can be resilient, right? And I can practice these things every day. And while you're practicing these things, well, guess what? Every now and then, there's going to be an opportunity to develop a venture. That's what the venture development activities. So every now and then in my life, I'll have an opportunity to start a venture. And you don't know when, you don't know where. It's the craziest damn thing. Over my career of 37 years, I have been, had ventures wink in and out of my life at the most unknown times, unbidden times, when I needed them, right? Here's an opportunity that comes along. It's like, wow, this is the greatest thing in the world. But you don't know when and you don't know where. But if you're practicing your development activities as an entrepreneur, you are ready when the opportunity arises. Right? And then you build a venture and you sell it, and now you got this white space. What do I do? I just sold my venture. What am I going to do now? Right? Well, you continue to develop yourself as an entrepreneur, and then another opportunity comes along. Believe me, folks, 37 years of doing this, it is it, it, I mean, this is not a great graphic because this is like, you know, it's like an electrocardiogram, right? I mean, that's the best I could do, right? But you know what I'm talking about. Right, as an entrepreneur, you don't know when or where those opportunities suddenly there it is. I meet the right people. I'll give you an example. Right, so a buddy of mine that I've known for a long time um, is tremendous in um, home improvement industry, which I know nothing about. Nothing about nothing at all. Home improvement, and uh, he has started several companies, very successful. But they weren't quite right for him, I could tell. And he was consulting with me throughout the whole process. And he would just sell off his assets and move on to the next one. And so finally, right, he had this opportunity to come along to sell Kohler products. Kohler products, right? Showers and walk-in tubs. And I said, you know what, Matt? I'll invest in that. Let's go. And so we started that thing in, in 2019. And we are now building that, and we will begin eventually franchising this. It's called Home Pride, and it just came out of nowhere. The Kohler contract came out of nowhere. When that hit, it was time to move, and you know, it's it's now we're just, you know it's, it's working very well for us. So, so that's what's key here, right? Entrepreneurial persistence is what's really the key, because. You know the stats on first time failures, right? Most ventures will not make it the first time up, right? Most entrepreneurs will not win with their first venture. I happened to do so. I was lucky I had a much older senior partner who knew what the hell he was doing. I did it. But the research is very clear. This is our article on entrepreneurial persistence, right? 
If you persist past the first failure, you are far more likely to succeed with number two, with number three, with number four, right? So you constantly are developing yourself as an entrepreneur throughout all this, right? And this is a little uh, graphic from Steve Blank that I really like. I, I teach this all the time. So. so now I've told you a little bit about my research. Now let's talk about the reality of starting a venture. When you start a venture, you know, a lot of times when, when, when uh, in the old, when the old way of thinking was you write a business plan and then you execute that plan, right? Well, good luck with that. I can tell you right now that in 11 companies or whatever the hell number I've started, I have never written a business plan before I started. Never, not a single time. So what you are really doing is searching. What are you searching for when you're starting your venture? You're searching for a repeatable, scalable business model. Repeatable value that you can bring to the market and, you know, it's not a one-off, right? You can repeat bringing that value to the market. Scalable, you can meet increasing customer demand and business model means you can actually make money doing this, right? And once you find that repeatable, scalable business model with whatever it is that you're doing, then you can begin to execute, right? So this applies over and over again. So when I'm thinking about, okay, maybe I got a going concern, and, I, and I'm doing okay, but I want to start some new product lines or some new services, I got to go back to this, right? And then once I find that, then I start executing it. I love this little graph, right? Very simple. Um, and then finally, um, uh, I like to teach this because this is the dis difference between the business school, generally speaking, and entrepreneurship. A business school teaches cause a lot. So we all know what this is, right? You set a goal, a smart goal, or whatever the heck you call it, right? Uh, you know, you've heard these, right? And my job then, because I've got this smart goal out here, it's, it's measurable, it's all that kind of stuff. I go get the means that I need to achieve that goal. That's fine. That's business. That's how it works, right? Once you have that repeatable, scalable business model in place, then you can do that. Entrepreneurs use a different type of logic. Entrepreneurs say, you know, I don't really know what the outcome is going to be, but I know what resources I currently control, and I'm going to create value with these resources. And it may take me in, in a million different directions. I don't know where it's going to end up, but I hope it's going to be a good place. Right? And it's like the difference between your dinner. I like to use the analogy of Italian dinner, right? So let's say I've got this significant other in my life. And um, I want to have a great Saturday experience with the sick you know. So I said, oh, I want to make an Italian dinner, right? So that's my predetermined goal. So I'm going to go out and get, you know, some pasta and some, you know, some, uh, some chili music and some red wine and some, you know, flowers and that kind of stuff. And I'm going to try to create this great spaghetti, uh, this Italian dinner experience, right? Okay, so that you can measure that. It was successful. My significant other said, oh, this was great. Now think about, okay, here we are, we're out, you know, going to Cherry Creek on Saturday afternoon, we come home at night, and, and you know, we're hungry, it's like, oh, well, what's in the cupboard? Well, look at here, we've got marshmallows, and we've got graham crackers, and chocolate, and, and, you know, all this stuff, and we're going to start, you know, mixing it all up, and we have no idea, but it could be a fantastic outcome, right? So, if we're trapped in only thinking causal logic in a causal logic perspective, we can never open ourselves to the serendipity of entrepreneurship, right? That serendipity that occurs because we find resources, we find people, we find other things that happen that we had no idea at the beginning. The point is to begin using the resources that you currently control to create value for the people, hoping that you will have an outcome that works. Everyone in my ventures has been like, when I discovered effectual logic, I didn't discover it. I discovered a paper written by Sarah Sarasvati from the University of Virginia that articulated this because they did research with expert entrepreneurs and found that this is the way they think about creating value. I thought, that's exactly what happened to me. I never knew what the heck my ventures were going to be. I just knew I wanted to make some money using the resources that I currently control, and they scale, and they grow, and they change, and they morph. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be open to that, right? So finally, I, I, I don't know how many slides I have here. I'm really 
anyway, um, so a lot of entrepreneurs make this make the mistake of starting over here with the solution phase, right? So they have a solution that's then searching for a problem. You want to start over here in the problem space. You have to really empathize with your market, get to know the market. Now, don't overdo this because you got to throw experiments out there. You got to test and prototype and see what the market says. And then when you finally begin getting some traction, you start getting some, some good reaction from the marketplace. That's when you start to execute. Right? So I see so many entrepreneurs that start over here. And this is what inventors sometimes make the mistake of. They invent stuff that doesn't have any kind of a practical commercializable purpose. And nobody can figure it out, right? So um, finally, I want to talk about, you know, this is the funding cycle. You know what this is, and, and it's, it, you know, it, everybody goes through this, right? So over here, when you get your first seed capital, this is the vaunted F, 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 and F, friends, family, fools, and founders, right? So friends, because they know you, family, because they love you, fools, because they don't know any better, and founders, because you gotta have some skin in the game. That's all the money that you're gonna have, and guess what happens? You start to lose it. We call it the valley of death. Because right? you do not get any traction. It's not working the way you want. You open up the office, everything is great. Phones aren't ringing. What the heck's going on? And then you start to maybe change. Right? You start to get some traction. You start to figure it out. That's when angel investors might step in. Why do we call them angel investors? You ever think about that? Why are they called angel investors? Two reasons. One is they do step in before anybody else. No banks will finance you here. No VCs will finance you here. Friends, family, fools, and founders are tapped out. Here's where angels step in. We call them angels because they fill that gap. The second reason we call them angels, they typically don't want to manage. They don't want to sit and have a, some kind of a role in your organization. They just want to go down to the country club and say, hey, I've invested in this really cool deal. And this great young person. And they're doing some really great work. And they, they include me in some of their meetings and stuff. And I really enjoy that. And then, of course, if you continue to get traction, then you, know, you get this hockey stick role then you might actually be eligible for some uh, VC financing, uh, venture capital financing, uh, or clearly, you know, because you're not cash flow break even, even banks will step up and begin to help you out with lines of credit and other kinds of things. But I can tell you right now, when you're in this valley of death, don't even bother talking to a banker. Not, not in the sense of, I'm here to get a loan. Build a relationship with a banker, sure, but you've got to get the cash flow break even. They will not touch you, believe me. Um, we've benefited greatly from the BPP and all that stuff with my business uh, you know, in the last year, but thank God it came along. Uh, at the time it did, it really helped us quite a bit. But uh, generally speaking, banks are going to be very, very risk averse on, on startups. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, where I'm going to very, get very practical. This is my current venture. It's called the Epic Venture Attractor. And um, let me tell you a little bit about this. We started this in January of 2020, right? Y'all remember that? <laughs> what that was like back in those days, right? <laughs> Pre-COVID. And then of course, you know, COVID hit. So we actually started under a different banner. We started as the Torch Grants program. And the Torch Grants program was based on a program that's being done in St. Louis where they raised $5 million. And they used that $5 million to give $50,000 grants to, re for, to companies to relocate to St. Louis, right? So. In a $5 million block, you can give 100 grants. And I, they started that in 2012, and I saw that that was a tremendously successful program. They, after five years, uh, they had given out 96 grants, and 88 of those companies were still located in St. Louis, and they had raised over $130 million in follow on financing, created thousands of jobs. So they went and got another $5 million, and they did it again, and, and they had similar success. So I said, let's do something similar here. Colorado Springs. We'll call it Torch Grants, right? St. Louis Arch, you know, the Olympic Torch, right? Pretty cool, isn't it? Anyway, uh, so we're going to raise two and a half million and, uh, and do the same thing. $50,000 grants for companies. The uh, obligation is that they have to stay here for at least a year. And, uh, you know, hopefully then, and, and we were going to focus on sports outdoor, health innovation, and human performance. And, and the uh, mission that we had was to help make Colorado Springs the worldwide destination for companies in that category. Why? Because we believe that's the natural cluster, that that cluster can develop. Well, by March, right, we couldn't get a meeting with anybody. We couldn't talk to anybody. 
we had raised about 250,000, but that you know was all just commitments. It wasn't actual cash in the bank. And nobody was taking meetings anymore because of COVID. So it's like, okay, now what do you do? So we had to shut everything down for about eight weeks. Everything was shut down. And then you pivot. So this is the last point I wanted to make about entrepreneurship is, that, is the value of the pivot. We pivoted. There was no more ability for us to raise that kind of capital in that environment, but we needed to keep going. We needed to keep moving. So we created this program. Uh, we've always called ourselves, it was the Torch Grants, a sports and lifestyle venture attractor. So we focused on the venture attractor piece. You can see we're still sports and outdoors, health, innovation, and human performance. And what we did was we created, uh, instead of giving grants to companies to relocate to our community, we created an online ecosystem to introduce companies worldwide to our community. And we created a educational uh, centerpiece of this called the Scale to a Million Startup Program. So companies from around the world applied to this thing, $3,000 a piece. Now they're paying me to get into my ecosystem, our ecosystem, the Colorado Springs ecosystem. And we ended up with eight companies that we selected, handpicked for the first cohort, which launched May 3rd. And uh, they are now learning how to scale to a million. We've got companies uh, mostly here in Colorado, but also around the world. We've got one company out of Nigeria that's in our program. And this is now what we did in, in the way of pivoting and adjusting to the environment that is, that is actual, the real environment that we're in. Even though our vision had to change, the, the execution of our strategy had to change, the core mission is still the same. Sports and outdoors, health innovation, human performance, cluster development here in Colorado Springs. So the, the, the value of the pivot and many companies have had to do that in the COVID era, right? Here, we're pivoting here, right? We got the Zoom camera going and all this stuff. We want to have a full room, right? So that's it. That's what we've done. And that's where we're at. And that's, um, and that's my talk. So do we take questions now or should I, should we wait to, till after? It's up to you guys. Sounds like you know Steve Blank. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of yeah, Steve. Yeah. Um, you know a guy named Will Schroeder out of Cincinnati? Um, he's, no. a, he's very much a definition of a, of a serial yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, he's actually writing a startup column now that I'll send you an email yeah. to if you might like. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about how the Epic Venture Attractor coordinates, consides, involves exponential impact. You guys follow similar paths? No, we, you know, I'm a, it's funny, I get that question all the time. Um, <laughs> well, I'm the new kid in town. So yeah, I'm so, curious. so, yeah, so, um, so here's how I look at it. You know, I, I mean, you got to understand what entrepreneurs are, right? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bull in a giant shop. I'm a headstrong person. I, I believe in my own vision. I have to see it through. So, number one is, I don't start collaborating until I get my thing going, right? So, once I get this thing going, uh, then if there's collaboration opportunities, fine, but exponential impact is a totally different model than us, right? Okay. They're a totally different market. They're looking at cybersecurity, blockchain, and things like that. And that's fine, right? That's great. I, I have long believed, ever since I came here 12 years ago, that the sports and outdoor cluster was the one that we should focus on here. And, you know, this is an experiment. This may or may not work. Right? And if it works, great. If not, you know, then, then we'll move on. But, uh, you know, it's it's like um, if this if if we're in if we're in Phoenix where I came from last, right, the city of seven to nine million people, I would never get a question like that. I would never get a question because there's so much going on. Everybody is doing something different, and they, they they don't care. I mean, we have so few things in this community that those questions always come up, right? In a city of seven hundred thousand people, metropolitan area. We need more of these kinds of things, more, because you don't know which one of them is going to be the one that really gets gets this entrepreneurial ecosystem going. And I don't know if it's going to be mine, or I, but I'm a pig-headed entrepreneur. I got to do things, and then we'll see where the collaboration opportunities are. I hope there are. I, I, you know, I know everybody over there. I love those people. They're fantastic. But I have to do my thing first. So okay, please. I'm sure. 
Tom, you get this question a lot too about price and how yeah. do you set your value? Yeah. And how do you not, right. how do you kind of change your perspective of you're yeah. delivering somebody value? What right. do you do to, to overcome that? Yeah, well, that's a great question. So, um, I mean, it depends. So when we started this thing, the Scale to Moon and Startup Program, we did benchmark with other kinds of programs around the country that might be similar, around the world actually, that might be similar to ours, what they're charging. Our program is a six month program. Uh, I know what my costs are. So I knew kind of, you know, that I needed to get X, X amount in the door to be able to cover my costs. And uh, so we ran an experiment. We said, okay, let's get started. Let's put it out there at this price. Uh, let's offer a discount for uh, uh, CU um, uh, grads and so on. So that was available. And then um, we've actually been told that we're drastically undercharged for what the value that we create. So when we do cohort number two, uh, we may start playing around with pricing. Uh, with my home pride business, uh, which is uh, selling polo products, um, we have tremendous now pricing power. So we've been in business for a couple of years and we can adjust our pricing uh, just by turning a dial so that our salespeople don't even know that we're raising prices, right? All they see in the end is what they, is what they put into the computer and all the different components of a, of a bathroom install. And there's the price. And we, we just did a price increase of 1.65%. Doesn't affect our sales whatsoever, right? And so we can literally make tens of thousands more per month just by turning a little dial because we've developed pricing power with our brand and our, and our quality of service and everything else, right? So when you're starting, you're experimenting, right? When you, when you start to develop that pricing power as a going concern, then you have a little bit more latitude in terms of what you can do with your pricing. It's, it's, a, it's a great place to be in once you establish that pricing power. Imagine, you know, um, uh, you know like um, Netflix, right? They raise, their, they raise their subscription fee by a couple of bucks, right? And with their hundreds of millions of subscribers, they just change their their bottom line by hundreds of millions of dollars and nobody even blinked an eye because they're so hooked into the content of that. It's a wonderful place to get to as an entrepreneur when you get to that pricing power. Yeah, it's, it's a fun thing. Great question. Okay. Thank you. Ready to sum up? Yes. A tough act to follow. <laughs> it was fascinating. And my name is Cindy Rayfield. Um, we talked about that earlier. I'm, I'm a franchise consultant at heart. So for 13 years, I've helped people to find franchises. It's what I do. I've got 700 franchises at my fingertips that I can share with people. So imagine, very much like Tom, I get excited when I see a new franchise come into my inventory. And I have it all at my fingertips. So what did I do with my entrepreneurial mindset? I found a franchise that I really liked. Now I'm working on franchise number two. It's like, like Tom was saying, sometimes the, the opportunity presents itself and there it is. Mine is going to be in the franchise world. It's typically where I'm comfortable. I love franchising quite a bit and I'll tell you why. But if I'm comparing and con contrasting Franchising in the entrepreneurial world, similar, similar to what Tom was talking about, franchising is one of those resources. So Tom talked about the resources. If you look at franchising as a whole, it's a resource. So somebody takes their entrepreneurial mindset and buys a franchise instead of doing the startup, they look at franchising as a resource. That's why they do it. Some people assume that franchises, because of what they are, it's implementing somebody else's idea, and turning it into a business or expanding the business based on somebody else's idea. Some people assume that that's not entrepreneurial, but in fact it is. It's just in the entrepreneurial mindset using the franchise model as a resource, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, what franchising is, first of all, and we're gonna talk about some of these, this journey that people go through. So a franchise is essentially um, a business, I, I like to call it a business in a box, and it's kind of a cute way of putting it, but really what it is, is it, it is a, uh, a business that can be replicated over and over again, similar to what Tom was talking about, with predictable results. So in the early stages of McDonald's, if you think back to McDonald's, the entrepreneurial side 
the person that created the McDonald's model was similar to what Tom was talking about. It was that startup phase. All of the franchises that are out there that people think of, those had to start somewhere. And they started from somebody who had an entrepreneurial bent, created a business model, and then they said, aha, I can help people grow my business by buying into the franchise. That's really what it is, okay? So they all start from someplace. But what I what sets franchises apart in many ways is it's capitalizing on somebody else's business model. But franchises already go into the world of problem solving. So in that problem solution graph that Tom was showing, um, the franchise already knows there's a problem. And somebody comes in and they're like, okay, I'm gonna buy this franchise because I want to solve this problem. I own children's hair salons. Kids need haircuts. It's a problem. And it was a big problem over COVID. We're doing better now than we ever did pre-COVID because the moms are like, oh, I see you. You're never going without a haircut again because I had to look at you all through COVID <laughs> with your nasty haircut. And that's not happening anymore. We are both solid back to back to back to back with haircuts right now. It, it doesn't go away. These are 15 minute haircuts that my stylist pump out every single day, seven days a week. 365 days a year. I mean, it's a problem. So every franchise out there solves a problem. They're not coming up with the new flashy, never been done before. That was done way back before they developed the franchise. Somebody came up with the idea, created it. But franchises, franchises already know that they solve a problem. They are salt of the earth. They are cleaning. There's so many people when I, they, when I talk to them, it's like, well, have you ever thought about a cleaning business? Nobody in this room has ever thought about owning a cleaning business. They don't, in their mind, I don't want to clean toilets. Well, that's not what you're doing. You're running an enterprise and cleaning businesses happen to be some of the most successful models in the world. Um, the oldest franchise models, the most successful, never goes away, always solves a problem. That's franchising, okay? So if you think about it, food, education, personal services, fitness, pet care. I mean, there's so many problems that franchises solve and there's a franchise for all of them. Okay, so let's talk about this entrepreneurial journey. So when we're talking about a startup versus a franchise, Tom went into the startup side. I've got people that are like, look, I'm an entrepreneur without an idea. That's what I focus on. Somebody who doesn't have an idea, but they know they've got this drive, this desire to be an entrepreneur. And we do think different, right? Listen, franchise or entrepreneurs think differently, whether they start a startup or they buy a franchise, they think differently. There is something going on in their head and a lot of it comes down to the virtues that Tom was talking about. There's something driving them that's deeper than just giving a paycheck. And so, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a startup or a franchise, um, I'm going to be talk comparing and contrasting the franchise side of this. We're going to talk about scaling and how franchises scale. Because scaling is all mm -hmm. you really need to do that. And that's part of growing a business. If you just start with one, you know, that's great. If you can scale a startup, and just by tweaking the pricing or something along those lines, in the franchise model, we do it by buying multiple units. Exiting, what does that look like? When we were first discussing this topic, exiting, does it, usually people don't think about that, but that white space in there, that's after people exit a business and they're looking at the next venture, why would somebody exit a business? Sometimes it's about opportunity, it's about timing. So let's talk about um, the practicalities, because what I love about the franchising model is there is there are definitely some practicalities to franchising that we don't always see in a startup model. Like um, somebody comes to me and they're like, I want to buy a business, but I don't know how much it's going to cost. Well, in the franchise model, I can give you a range. I can tell you if you're going to buy a hair care salon, you're looking at anywhere between $125,000 on the low end to start one to $300,000 on the high end. And I can give you precisely the line item, like by line item, um, costs for each of these things. So franchises can take out some of that unknown because they know what it's gonna cost. They've done it before. So my salon, Cookie Cutters Haircuts for Kids, we have hundred units operating, 200 sold. That franchisor knows precisely how much it's gonna to take to open each location. It may be a little bit different in Colorado Springs than it is in Denver, a little bit different in San Francisco than it is in Houston, but we got a range and we know about how much it's gonna cost and how much somebody needs to allocate to get this open. If we need to buy this glass door, how much is that gonna cost on average in different cities? They know this, they've gone through that. They also, um, uh, 
some of the important aspects of starting a business, one of the most important things is the cost. And that's something that everybody needs to be aware of. Franchises have something that a startup business doesn't have. Can you see this okay down here? Franchises have something called the Franchise Disclosure Document, the FDD. And it's got an outline of everything you need to do to get this business started. Because again, there's been hundreds of them, supposedly. I mean, some there are some newer brands. We call them emerging brands. And the emerging brands are fun because they're a little bit more towards that entrepreneurial side because you don't know. And the franchisor's like, yeah, I think it's going to work. Let's see what we can do. I've got a few of those. And I've got a few people looking at those, which is so interesting. But they all have this franchise disclosure document that's going to lay out everything that the franchisor knows that they've taken out of their head and they've put on paper. So that franchise or disclosure document is how people actually do their research when they're buying a franchise. So let's talk about money. Um, item seven is that list in the franchise disclosure document that lists everything, line item by line item, how much something's going to cost. I knew when I read my FDD about what I was going to expect for hiring employees, money I need to have set aside to pay rent for several months, how much it's going to cost to do the build out, how much I'm going to have to pay for advertising. And there's a beautiful thing. I'm just, just a little aside here. There's a beautiful thing after you've been open for a certain period of time when you don't have to pay as much for advertising because your brand is known and you can just go back and tap your database. I'm just going to tell you. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that Tom was talking about in that, that uh, it was your very last slide that talked about the valley of death mm -hmm. before you start seeing that rise. When you get to a point, and the beauty of franchising is they can pretty much tell you about the time you're gonna, when you're going to start seeing that, like maybe 18 months, maybe two years. But it's a beautiful thing when you start to see it and it starts happening and you're going, oh my gosh, this is just, there is something that lights an entrepreneurial fire under you when you're like, yeah, yeah, that feels good. Mm -hmm. So um, item seven in the franchise disclosure document goes through what the costs are going to be, what it's going to look like as you move through this process, what you're going to have to come up with, how you're going to have to pay these things. How do they know? They've done it. They've done it many, many times before. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about here, just really quickly, I know we don't have a lot of time, but in the franchising model, one of the things that Tom talked about in the startup model, there's a period of time where the bank is not going to talk to you, that you can't get funding, you can't go to the bank in a traditional sense. In the franchise model, you can, because of the track record, because of the FDD, because it's been done before, they can be easier to finance, so there's opportunities for getting funding, um, for for borrowing from certain um, alternative lenders, things like that, where maybe a startup doesn't have that opportunity to do that. So I kind of educate people. I'm not a banker, I'm not a financier, but I'm actually able to help people understand where they can get the money in order to do this and give some resources. Some banks that are very attuned, there's banks here in the Colorado Springs marketplace that are very hip on lending to franchises um, versus a startup. Now, they're not going to give you all of it. This is the thing. A bank is always going to ask for some sort of cash injection, and there's no guarantee that a bank is going to lend to a franchise. But the opportunity is there because of the franchise model, because it's been done before. Um, there's going to be some extra cost for a franchise versus a startup. When I've done startups, and one of the things that I loved about a startup is I could do it on a shoestring. It didn't cost me anything to try some things out, or very little, and I was able to experiment. Uh, in the franchise model, you have to buy a franchise license right up front. And that franchise license to, to operate somebody else's idea in a marketplace can cost several thousand dollars to um, five figures, like anywhere from maybe 20,000 to 60,000 to 90,000. So there's the franchise license fee that you have to pay up front. There's value in what somebody has created for you. So you're going to be paying a fee for that. In addition, there's something called royalties. And this is one of the things that somebody who wants to do a startup, royalties is like a dirty word. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've, I've done both a startup and a franchise. There is value in royalties. When we're talking about value, there are value in royalties. One of the things that you get from your royalties is support from the franchisor. The franchise can't exist without the support of all the franchisees. So you pay back a percentage of revenue. Sometimes it's a flat fee, but you're paying it to the franchisor to provide something of value for you 
like maybe their methodology for getting clients, their software systems, their unique products or services, their idea, their expertise in the marketplace, the way they do um, marketing and advertising. So you pay that money back, but there's value that you should get from that as well. And that's outlined in the FPA. I'm going to talk about a few of those here. But royalties can be a dirty word for those who are like, hey, I can do this on my own. I don't need to pay somebody else for that. But again, those entrepreneurs without an idea, you find value in royalties. I pay a 6% royalty to run my cookie cutter salons. I get so much value because they provide so much value for that. There's things that they can do for me that I couldn't pay somebody to do for any less money than what I'm already paying in royalties. So to have somebody, a graphic designer to do all of my social media, I couldn't pay somebody to do that. My royalties are less than what I would pay somebody in a salary to do that. So you have to think about what that give and take is. Again, disadvantages and advantages of it. Um, there's some important aspects that nobody talks about, which is what I love about franchising is I'm able to give some practical advice to people when it comes to financing because nobody shares this. I've, I have been a volunteer at local um, events where I'm really just supposed to go out and give people a raw, raw, raw story about starting up a business. But I have to give the practical side because nobody thinks about it and a lot of other advisors won't do it. But the practical side is you got to know what your numbers are. You got to know what it's going to take to open this business. And one of those numbers that you need to know is your net worth. If you're going to be borrowing from a bank, if you're doing this, if you have money in the bank, you got all the money in the world, write a check, to cover these costs, maybe your net worth doesn't matter. But if you're going to go to the bank and get funding, you better know what your net worth is. Net worth is obviously for those who might not know, some people don't know, it's all of your assets lined up in one column, all of your liabilities lined up in the other column. You subtract your liabilities from your assets, whatever number down there at the bottom is, that is your net worth. Okay, if it's negative, it's not a good thing. <laughs> um, franchises know what the net worth of their potential candidates needs to be so that they can go out and get financing. So when I'm sharing franchises with people, I'm finding out what the financial picture is. I get people that put up a, you know, a wall like, hey, I don't want to tell you what my finances are. Well, when you go to buy a house, do you tell your real estate agent what your finances are? Do you tell the bank? Well, of course you do. So they can find the right house for you. I need the same thing because there are franchises that will not have a conversation with you if you don't meet the minimum net worth requirements. If you're looking at buying a hand and stone massage spa or an elements or something along those lines, you need to have a very high net worth. Well, I'm not going to show that to somebody who's got a hundred thousand dollar net worth. It's not a fit. So you have to know what your numbers are. And again, a lot of people don't want to know it. It's head in the sand. I just want to buy a franchise or I just want to start a business. But if you don't know where you're starting from, it's really hard to dig your way out of it. You need to have some liquid capital. That's the cash injection that I talked about. You need to have that cash injection um, money set aside so that, because again, the bank's not going to give you all of it. They just aren't. Um, and many banks require 20% cash injection. There are a few alternative lenders that may charge a 10% cash injection, but in all honesty, 20 is pretty much the standard. You have to put 20% in. Uh, there's different ways to finance a franchise. Most franchises, any ones that I recommend, are generally on the franchise directory. That's how banks make decisions about lending to franchises if you're on the franchise directory. So some franchises aren't. That doesn't keep them from doing business. It doesn't always keep them from getting funding for their franchisees, but the franchise directory is helpful. Um, and they know the history of the franchise by doing that too, because the FED provides the history and the background of the franchise. And nobody but the bank is going to tell you a lot of these things. So I really do feel like I'm doing people a service by telling them the realities. If you're not going to share your financials with me, I can't make a good fit for you. I can't give you good advice. So I'm very passionate about knowing what the numbers are and giving people real advice so that they know how to go into this. Um, other important items in the FED. These are there's 23 bullet points in a franchise disclosure document, and every franchise has one. It has to be updated every year, so it's fresh. I tell people to focus on certain items. Item 11 is obligations of a friend of the franchisor. What are you paying for your royalties? What are they giving you back? You need to study the item 11. Item 19, if the franchise has an earnings claim, item 19 is the earnings claim. That's you know, tell me the picture. What do most people make? What are people making on average? 
Most franchises are going to give a low, medium, and high performer average in their um, FDD if they provide an item 19, which by the way is optional. But when I talk with franchisors, a lot of advice comes from brokers like me. It's like, hey, you need to get your item 19. This is what people want to know. Mm -hmm. This is what they want to know. They don't want to go in blind. They want to know, are people making money? Are they doing it? And the item 19 can provide that. Item 20 is a list of all franchises currently in existence right now. And the beauty of a franchise is you can call these people. This, there's a list of every franchisee in the system. You get to call those people and find out, hey, is what the franchise is telling me actually true? Are you making money? When did you make money? And you can generally tell it's people who are like, yeah, I hate this thing. This is like a burden on my back. I want to get, I want to offload it versus the one, ones who are like, best decision I ever made. So you get a chance to talk to those people and there's no other business model like it in the world that's franchising. You get to talk to people who are actually doing it. When I did startups, I didn't get to call my competitors and ask them how they were doing. They would have just laughed me out the door. So I'm like, I'm making it up on my own. And item 21, um, just drew a blank here. I think item 20, oh, I, item 21 is failures in the system. You wanna know that too? You wanna know how many are still out there as well as how many didn't make it because they have to report it. They have to include it in their, in their item 19 or in their franchise disclosure document. Item 23 is actually the contract. That's the contract that you're going to sign. And I recommend that people work with a, with a really skilled franchise lawyer, franchise attorney to review this. If you don't understand it, you need to really understand what it means. So we're going to talk about really quickly, and Emma, are we, is 10.15 the end time? Uh, no. Okay, it's just kind of, I don't want to like rush, but at the same 10, time. 10.30, but. Okay. Questions after okay, great. Um, the way a franchise is becomes scalable is through multiple units. I have two units of a children's hair salon. My first one I bought from somebody else. I had a big shift to turn around. I had to dump a lot of money into advertising, uh, rehire employees. Um, so sometimes people are like, oh, it's great. We'll just buy somebody else's business. You just need to know that you're buying somebody else's business with all of the warts that come with it. And there were definitely warts. There are some businesses that are fabulous to resell, but you have to dig in. So when somebody's exiting their business, there's this truth and honesty between the two, like here's what you're getting. In the hair, so the hair salon industry, sometimes that means you have to fire your entire staff and start again. It's kind of the way it works. Sometimes you might keep the manager and rehire everybody else. So those are things that I had to do. I had, to, even though I got it at a great deal, I had to dump money in it to turn it around because the old owner wasn't doing it. So I got a great deal. That's when you hear about those great deals, the businesses that you buy. That's a great deal. But I still had to put my sweat equity and I was there every day for the first year and I was putting a lot of money into it to turn it around. Okay, that's great. Well, then it's time to open number two because I know if I don't have number two open, I'm only relying on number one. And it's really hard to make a franchise work when you've got one unit open and you're hoping and praying that this is going to be the thing. What multiple units does is it offsets your risk, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like, oh my gosh, it's more money going in. But the really good news is once number two is up and running, I've got number two up and running. They, it's weird. I can look at one month and have one store doing great and the other store doing a little bit off and then the next month it switches and does just the opposite. I've only got two open now, but I got licensed for a third. A third one into that dynamic totally changes it, changes everything. And then suddenly it's like an ebb and flow. So when you're talking about people who own multiple units of a concept, like um, we were talking earlier about uh, somebody who owns multiple um, chicken franchises, for instance, they, she, she was talking about a successful entrepreneur who exited his business. He sold all seven of his chicken franchises. Okay. I think it was Popeye's. Well, starting with one was one thing. And she saw him through the growth until he got the seventh one going. Here's the beauty of business ownership that you don't get when you have a job. You get to earn income and build equity at the same time. And this is true for a franchise. This is true for a startup. When you go to sell that business, that's where you reap a lot of the benefits. That's when people retire for real <laughs> You know, when they actually exit the business and they, they can 
live on the equity. Okay. Um, so that's where franchises scale. That's how they scale. They grow multiples. There are some franchises that are designed to be single units, but those are few and far between. Most of them uh, grow by multiples. So a lot of times when people are buying franchises, they're buying multiples at the offset, at the onset, but they're not doing them all at the same time. They're doing one and building the next and building the next until they have a bunch of property together. Um, where to start a franchise, you start with one and you grow. Uh, I, I made a little typo here. What is this? Is this normal? Really what that, what this is referring to is that mindset that Tom was talking about. I tend to see this with people. You're in one, you're six months in, you're a year in, you're kind of going, this isn't what I thought. This isn't what I expected. This is uncomfortable. And there might be a time when there's like this entrepreneurial regret. And I see it sometimes. Like th their expectations are killing their satisfaction. And I see it all the time. And it, it doesn't happen with people who have jobs because their expectation is, I'm going to get a check and I'm going to go and spend it. When you're an entrepreneur, your expectations is, are, I'm going to knock this thing out of the park. But it doesn't always happen that way. And so there's a little bit of regret that happens or a little bit of things that, that come into play where you're going, did I make a bad decision? Did I make this wrong? And what, entrepreneurial, what entrepreneurs do is they turn it around into an advantage and they continue to go on. So that failure that Tom is talking about, a lot of entrepreneurs go through it. All entrepreneurs go through it at one point in time. And you have to see the failure to enjoy the success. Entrepreneurs know that. And they're willing to live in that state of discomfort because that's truly what it is. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I didn't know the pandemic was going to happen and shut down my stores for eight weeks. I didn't know that. So we're both willing to live in that discomfort. So I kind of got on, on a tangent here. But, you know, even in scaling the business, you, you run into that too. It's like, when is the right time to open your second one? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I, there's a lot of franchises out there right now making assumptions like, it's a great time to open a brick and mortar business. Landlords are willing to deal. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. We assume that landlords are willing to deal and deal because they've just through, been through this pandemic when some people weren't paying their bills. But we don't know that. So a lot of times we're working from assumptions. Even franchisers work from assumptions too. Well, what I'd like to tell people to do, especially in a franchise, is remove yourself from your business. Work on your business, not in your business. That's kind of the mantra of franchising. I don't cut hair. My idea was not to come in with this brand new model of hair cutting because I'm not a stylist. What I'm really good at is growing the team, scaling it. I'm good with customer service. I know what my model is. Little kids come in, parents pay $24 for a haircut. It sounds crazy expensive against great lips. But those kids get to sit in a car Get to watch TV, Netflix, Disney Plus, whatever they want, whatever movie they want by the, time, by the time they're sitting in that car and they walk out with a balloon and a lollipop and they get to go down the slide and mom and dad hand over the credit card and say thank you mm -hmm. every time. I raise my haircut prices, speaking of pricing, I raise my haircut prices about once a year by a dollar. Do you think anybody blinks? Heck no, they hand me their credit card because they get value out of that interaction. They gave their kids an experience that they would have, would have wanted to have when they were kids. I know this. I know it. I'm deep down passionate about it. I know if I raise my haircut prices, people will pay it. I am confident in that every single time because I'm giving them value. So remove yourself from, from your business. Know what business you're in. If you're selling widgets, that's great. But know what value you bring to the widget selling process. Again, I don't cut hair, but man, I can, I can hire some good stylists and I can build a team and I know what it's worth. Okay. Um, let's get back in, buy multiple units. This is how franchises scale. Uh, using franchisor guidance is also how they scale, really following with the franchisor. Because guess what? If Meineke still opened franchises and trained all of their, their 40 year old franchise, keep this in mind, trained all of their owners and all of their employees on cars that were, were built 40 years ago, they wouldn't be in business. They pivot, they change. The model changes a little bit. Things change in the marketplace. Different trends come in. Franchises can actually pivot too, and they do a lot of times. Um, so a lot of franchisees are looking at their franchisors for guidance. It's part of what you're paying in your royalties too. 
understanding trends and how things change. Like Facebook, who would have thought that I get most of my clients on Facebook? 10 years ago, Facebook wasn't even around. I don't, well, I think it was around, but I look back at my memories of what I posted on Facebook 10 years ago. It's like, oh my gosh, it's the stupidest thing that I said. <laughs> it's very, vastly different now. It's a different way of communicating. But I, that's how I get most of my business. I would have, nobody would have ever thought that you would get most of your business from Facebook 10 years ago. But we had to adapt. We had to pivot. You're going to see frustration along the way. You have to love your business like a new family member. This goes for a startup or a franchise. If you don't treat your business with respect, you are doing a, a disservice. I treat my business like it's a member of the family because guess what? It's at the dinner table with me every single night. It is a topic of conversation. It's my husband's and my investment, my family's investment. It's part of our lives. So if you bring home a new puppy, you know you're gonna, probably gonna have to crate train it you know, for a little while and it's probably gonna pee on the carpet. Listen, that's what a new business does, whether it's a startup or, or a franchise. And you have to be willing to love your business through all of the good and the bad, because as that, that puppy matures into a, a well-rounded adult dog and you appreciate taking it on walks, and now it walks really well with you on a leash, you don't have to drag it with you when you're trying to teach it how to walk on a leash. I think just treat it with respect that you would treat a new puppy or a new baby that you bring home, because it changes the dynamics of your family life. Again, separate the function of the owner from the function of the business. Duplicating what you've done before, that's what scaling is. Some of this, I'm not gonna go over as, as much and um, we're running out of time here. Um, but when you exit a business, remember that you love it. I love my business, but someday I plan to exit it. And just know there's gonna be an exit date. There has to be an exit date. You have to figure that out. Uh, fully retire. Some people do it because they want to try a different business. I've had people that have come back to me and started, you know, bought or invested in a totally different franchise that they never would have done the first time around because they gained some confidence through that first time. Um, franchises typically have a 10 year license. For a lot of people, they use it as a bridge to retirement. Uh, and you can, again, I go back to this. When you own a business, whether it's a startup or a franchise, you are earning income during the time that you're also growing equity. Is this truly an investment? So that's really what I have. Um, it's a great retirement strategy. I'm gonna leave it at that. Now, I hope I didn't go over. I hope I have time for some questions and maybe Tom, there's gonna to be questions for Tom too. <laughs> what am I? Neil I'm the man questions. Question. <laughs> <laughs> that's your job. That's your job, Neil. <laughs> I'm one of these. <laughs> What's the what's the biggest issue that you see with uh, franchise owners exiting? Biggest and, issue. and I ask that for a very specific reason because I'm, I'm dealing with clients now that are exiting their businesses and having a hard time doing that. Um, well, there's all sorts of reasons why people exit a business. They're doing it early. It's generally because their expectations are killing their happiness or their mm -hmm. satisfaction. Um, there was the expectation that they were going to kill it because they had it in their head. They were going to kill it. And then they hit, they were met with reality, which generally the franchisor is going to tell you, Hey, yeah, you're growing this. This is, you know, you're not going to knock this out the park in the first year. You might think you do. Cause I, I've had people that are like, I'm going to be different than everybody else. I'm just going to kill it the first year, six months. I'm going to just be killing it. Really you just follow what the franchisor said, because one of the things that I've noticed, Neil, you and I talked about this. The, the person who sold me my first business or sold me the first unit of the cookie cutter haircut business had only been in business 18 months. She hated every minute of it because it didn't meet her expectations. But about 18 months in that model is when your database starts growing and you start seeing results, but she couldn't get past 18 months. So I think the biggest challenge is the expectation that this thing is supposed to do what I envision in my mind, and it's not doing it. Um, because again, I don't have a crystal ball. Nobody does. We can't see what's happening in the future, but entrepreneurs are willing to see what's going to happen in the meantime, and let's just see what, what the outcomes are down the road. So I think that's the biggest thing. And truly, I have people that talk to me about, okay, what's the next phase? I'm at this point in my business, and what's the next phase? 
most of the people that come to talk to me that want advice about where what they should do next in their business, it all revolves around the, the sales base because sales are the, is the base. Mm -hmm. And without sales, that's the oxygen for your business. Without sales, you can't see profit. You can't see impact. You can't see legacy. All of those other things that build on top of that. Uh, most people are having trouble with the sales area and sales and expectations. Um, I used to sell magazine. I used to do... Um, Ad sales, like go into people's business and say, you need to you know, buy into my magazine because you need exposure. At the end of the day, nobody ever wanted to buy it, but they all knew that they had to do something. So, you know, whether it's the right path, a lot of people don't want to put money into advertising. A lot of people just assume that people should they open the doors and people should come. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I think the expectations generally are not met. And that's why a lot of people sell their business in the early phase or something happens like a pandemic, and they're like, yeah, I, I, I've got to exit, which happened to a lot of people who are food, food companies or, or restaurants in general. They couldn't make it through. But interestingly enough, there's people that are coming in now with lots of money that are buying food franchises because it's a good time to get into food. Who would know? I don't know if that answered that. Well, it, it's it, it, part, of, part of what I'm running into is a lot of boomers who are are realizing they want to exit the business, whether it's a franchise or a startup or whatever. Do you see any trend in them going, leaving one franchise, going to another one, or retiring, or going back to work for somebody else, or is there any pattern? I've seen all of the above. Um, one of the things that, just kind of going back a little bit, when people go to sell their business, what people don't understand is that they're, they're, they have to be selling cash flow in order to see like some sort of uh, profit in what they're selling. So if your business isn't cash flowing, the whole reason why somebody's going to buy your business is because it's cash flowing. Um, it's really easy to say that there's the potential. People don't usually buy on potential; they buy based on numbers. So they may buy a little bit on potential, but they want to know the numbers. So if you can't. Uh, prove that it's cash flowing, it's really difficult to sell it for three times cash flow when there is no cash flow. You might be able to sell furniture, fixtures, and equipment, an operating system, and maybe get out of what get out of it what you put into it. So sometimes people do that and they go back to a job. Other times people are like, well, I learned a lot in that business. Okay, and I've had this happen. We sold that. Now we're going to invest in another franchise and apply what we learned from that one into another one. So what some people might consider a failure or maybe something that didn't do what they expected, I've seen people that are like, okay, I'm giving it a shot again. Those are kind of the very entrepreneurial people. But to say that I'm seeing a trend, I can't really say that I'm seeing a trend. I see all kinds. Um, lots of people go back into the workforce. Um, I, I've had military people that I work with here in Colorado Springs that sell their business and they continue to stay in the military and they just continue down that path. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's hard to say. Some people truly do retire. Some people are like, look, I'm done. I'm done dealing with employees. I'm done dealing with coworkers. I'm done dealing with, you know, the corporate life. And I'm just out and I'm going to travel. So it, if they sold it for a good amount of money, they could probably do that. Well, uh, there's an uptick in business sales over the last year simply because of COVID. Because yes. they don't want to, they don't have the energy or the interest in rebuilding their business. Absolutely. They're just exhausted. They're tired. Right. And I can, I can understand that. I mean, I'm tired. There's time when I'm, days when I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my goodness, I got to hire another employee. I'm tired. But um, I can definitely see that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Cindy and Tom. We appreciate you all being here. And those of you joining us online, um, we will have a recording of this available as well if there's any little nuggets that you want to go back and rewatch. But otherwise, thank you so much for being here with us today. For those of you in person, feel free to stay and chat a little while if you prefer it. Thank you all. We appreciate you. Thank you.